Hi, Chris, and thank you very much for joining us today. Chris, when looking at where lithium comes from, jurisdiction is increasingly important. E3 lithium operates in one of the best jurisdictions in the world, in Alberta, Canada, and the province of Alberta has a rich history in oil and gas, and this bodes well for E3 lithium, given you will be using direct lithium extraction or DLE process. And these types of projects are very similar to oil and gas operations. And I want to start here, and maybe you can just start with the support that E3 Lithium has received from both the provincial and the federal governments in terms of funding. Yeah, I think E3 has been um, pretty fortunate. We've, we've started off uh, this project in Alberta um, developing a, a direct extraction from a, a very famous aquifer called the Leduc. Um, as everybody probably knows, Alberta is well known for its oil and gas industry, and there's a lot of parallels between how we operate and how uh, an oil and gas company operates in the province it can, on the conventional side. And so um, that synergy has uh, prompted, I think, a lot of interest in developing a lithium industry in Alberta across the board, um, from government to industry, and mainly because, you know, to get a, uh, a skilled worker in Calgary, whether you're you're in the in, a, in Calgary working at, at the head office, you're out in uh, operating at a site or anything in between, um, we have the skill set here in Alberta to do what we're trying to do. So it's a very small step to move from uh, developing a uh, oil and gas project to developing a lithium project. And I think for that reason, there's been a lot of interest from the federal and provincial governments. To support this project um, the provincial government uh, has thrown some funding at it uh, but the biggest thing that we've seen is a couple of years ago they brought into uh, law a bill that brought the regulatory authority for lithium under the uh, alberta energy regulator who regulates oil and gas and that is fundamental to the ability for us to to permit this project because it has a now a firm home in a in a regulatory environment that's well established um, not just from a permitting perspective, but also a social license perspective. Um, the, the, we will op operate on private land. You'll see some, some farmer's fields behind me. Um, that is our project area. Um, and there's an ecosystem for working with the local farmers to put, for example, a well on their property. They get paid a little bit of money. Um, that helps them out when the yields aren't as good. And, and there's a, a relationship there that is well established and a respect between industry and the and the landowners. And that will dovetail very well into the lithium industry because again, we operate very similarly. We will be doing the same sorts of activities. From the federal government perspective, there's been a big push from a geopolitical side um, to get local sources of lithium um, into the North American supply chain. Um, the Canadian federal government and the US federal government have signed um, agreements to make that happen and to streamline processing um, uh, and all of those other uh, opportunities, including funding. So we've received $30 million from the federal government to develop this industry. And I think largely because of the ability to have a diversified industry so we can produce lithium in Alberta, but also um, that we're the first. So we're, we're cutting edge here of developing this industry, but there are others in the, in the area in Western Canada trying to develop these projects. And the success for E3 means success, most likely, therefore, for the rest of those companies and the industry across the province and in Saskatchewan as well. You raised some very interesting points here. And one thing we cannot underestimate is the support of the public. And you mentioned or you touched on the social licensing. But because Alberta has such a strong history in oil and gas, you have the support of the people of Alberta with this project. Yeah, and I think it's been a very important piece of where E3s come from. Um, you know, all of our staff, say for one, have been hired out of Alberta's workforce. Um, everyone understands how to build and operate uh, projects here in the province. And it's a little bit different than the mineral industry because this isn't really mining. You know, we're, we're drilling wells and extracting a fluid in a closed loop system. So the, the impact to the environment um, from a surface perspective and, and from impacting like freshwater aquifers is, is very, very minimal. And especially when you look at how traditional um, lithium is produced. So I think those really bode well because that environmental, um, which is dovetails very closely with your social license, because if you don't have an impact, um, the local communities uh, are getting jobs, but they're not seeing an impact to the environment. 
and the the combination of the two I think uh, sets E3 uh, ahead of, of most. And I'm glad you brought this up. I want to delve into this a little bit different. And just as a reminder to our viewers, lithium is typically mined by traditional hard rock mining, which is what we have in Ontario or the province of Quebec and also in Australia, where we have evaporation ponds that we find in Chile. But in Alberta, the extraction method will be using direct lithium extraction or DLE. Maybe you can just expand on that a little bit more and what this process means. Yeah, I mean, traditionally, um, lithium, before the lithium race for batteries, there was one hard rock mine in Australia, and lithium was produced as a byproduct in evaporation ponds. Um, since the advent of the lithium battery, and, and more so the, the commercial use of that battery in uh, stationary storage, mostly uh, electric vehicles and other applications, I mean, you can't, you can't find a battery now that's in a high power device that's not lithium from your power tools to your scooters, everything is now using lithium. The reason is because it packs uh, a large amount of energy density uh, per weight. So you're able to uh, put a small amount of power in a very small um, cell. And that has really changed the lithium industry, but there's not, looking at that industry from uh, its infancy is really only about the past 10 years. While we produced lithium before that, we didn't need it in the quantity that we do in the future. So we're talking 3 million tons of lithium required in the next 10 years or so. Um, we currently produce about 500,000 tons, a little bit less than that. So we have to scale this six times in the next 10 years. I mean, mining just doesn't, uh, extractive industries just don't scale that quickly. You can build battery factories that quickly, but you can't build mines that quickly. And so when you look at it from the perspective of what we're doing, um, this chemical process to do the extraction of lithium enables us to ex, uh, to expand and scale very rapidly um, because you're just you you drill the well the product comes to the surface and you're putting it through the system and within hours you have a product at the back end and that's a big differentiator between the, uh, from the rest of the supply chain the solars take a long time usually it's it's 12 to 8 to 24 months depending on the solar and the rain um, before you get the lithium into a product that you can take to market. In a, in a hard rock mine, most of them today, and, and I can think of it, an example where this isn't the case, um, you mine it, you create a, a concentrate at the mine, and then it's transported for processing. The majority of lithium right now is coming out of Australia, about 55%. That's uh, mostly processed in China. So it's, it's put on a ship um, at port at 6% lithium, and then it's transported by ship to China where it's processed. And then from that perspective, 80% of the lithium we um, consume today in terms of the battery quality lithium comes out of, of China. And so having a local source here that is this big, I mean, one of the big advantages to E3's project is that we can scale this up to be a global size. 150,000 tons is our estimate with a mine left of around 25 to 30 years. So it's a significant source of lithium um, that is local. Um, we will produce the battery products directly out of the back of the facility. Um, and all of that, uh, you know, for a company enables us to grow and expand and, and become a global leader in producing lithium in a very stable jurisdiction. So Chris, let's do a deeper dive on E3 lithium. You and your team have achieved many milestones in 2023, beginning with the resource update. Can you touch on the highlights of that report and how this positions E3 lithium's resource just in terms of size? Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, resource upgrade was the, the result of a lot of work. We drilled some wells, we did some production testing to gain an understanding of the aquifer, where we actually plan to uh, locate the first facility. Um, and that led to the upgrade of measured indicated for a total of 16 million tons. Um, and it's it's a significant size. It is a global size. There's <clears throat> pardon me, not that many resources in one area that are bigger than this. Um, and when you look at it from the perspective of Canada, the rest of Canada's measured indicated resources total 3.2 million tons. So this is roughly about five times larger than all of the rest of Canada's resources combined. So it is a very significant size, but I think it it goes to the size of the opportunity here. But I mean, Alberta does things big um, in the oil and gas industry. Everything that has happened in Alberta, it's always been global scale. You know, the third largest reserves of oil are in, in the province globally. So um, it's we have the same 
geologic uh, sort of system here, the same geologic stratigraphy that has enabled that same boasting from the oil and gas industry that we are now seeing from the lithium industry. We just have a very good stratigraphic package of rock that has lots of water in it in this one particular formation that happens to have lots of lithium. Um, it's, it's interesting because this aquifer started the oil rush in 1947 in Alberta when they discovered oil. Um, and it's been the oil has been produced off of it uh, pretty much now completely. But at, even at that time, it was the, the majority of the fluid in there by like 99% was lithium and rich brine. Um, the market has just changed. That's all in terms of what, what we're interested in producing from it. Um, so, you know, I think the, that understanding and that size aspect, uh, Alberta is uh, well placed to capitalize on. That's an interesting point. I didn't realize the oil and gas reserves were so large. You say number three in the world? Yeah. Interesting. Chris, another milestone was the operation of the pilot plant and the subsequent results. Can you provide an overview of this and, and the results touching on the recoveries and also the impurities and in, in the concentration? Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the pilot was uh, a very strong success for the company. Um, you know, we started it, uh, constructing it in the spring. Um, we got the thing operational in July. We were commissioning DLE in August and and have been running it since. We're just in the final phases of um, the first two systems that we tested um, right now. And uh, the results that we've put out um, for uh, the first system that we tested, which are now public, um, demonstrated that we're able to produce a very high quality concentrate. Um, so not just lithium grades, we take it from 75 to about 900, um, but the purity is also very, uh, very high. So it's about 80%, which is important for the downstream. Um, it allows you to simplify the processing. But I think what's most fundamental to this is the amount of brine they're able to flow. Um, and we, we, we've given a ratio called a flow rate ratio, which is really, the amount of brine you can flow per given amount of the, the chemical the absorbent. And what that's really talking about is the speed at which the lithium comes out of the brine. And if you can get the lithium out of the brine faster, you need less equipment. So your capital bill is smaller and your operating cost is smaller. And that is absolutely fundamental. And you would sacrifice that over the quality of the concentrate and even in some part, the, the, the concentration. So you want to have a high recovery. So you the, the number one aspect is, I think, recovery. You want to see a high recovery because you have to take all the energy and effort to get the lithium molecule to the surface. You want to maximize that by getting the, the most lithium you can out of that that you that is possible. So that that is measured by the recovery. So seeing 94% recovery is very, very high. Um, and then if you can do that at faster rates, which is what we were able to demonstrate, um, means we can build smaller equipment. So you get the same amount of lithium out, but you have to build smaller amount of equipment. And those will boast very well for us when we look to complete the economics for this project. The quality of the concentrate is a bonus. There's a lot of systems downstream of this because you can you further refine that lithium concentrate to something that becomes battery grade. So we would sacrifice a bit lower lithium in that um, and a bit pure, a uh, bit less quality, um, because you have to refine it anyway. If you can reduce the size of your capital equipment for the, the process, and we've we've explained that in the news announcements where that we've put out that the real focus on this was that flow rate ratio and seeing that increase, and we've seen huge uh, um, amount of increase than we anticipated. We anticipated a, a ratio of three. And the results we put out for the third party are nine, and we're going to put ours out soon that are going to be even higher. So that fundamentally enables us with confidence to go forward and complete the uh, pre-feasibility study that's currently underway. Okay, I'm glad you brought that up. What? Let's talk about the pre-fees. What's the timeline associated with this? Yeah, so it's currently underway right now. I'm working the FLIR, as we've announced. Um, it's likely that we'll be completing it um, internally by the end of this year, early, early next. Um, then we have to do the process of writing it into the standard NI4301 format. So we're anticipating uh, sometime in Q1 to have that uh, that published. And I think that's a big catalyst for us um, because it, it enables the, the movement forward in a lot of ways. It enables us to start the, the feed, the uh, feasibility study 
that enables us to start in earnest going to, to talk to uh, potential partners to look for financing for this project and all of the other aspects that are important um, as as 2024 for me and the corporate team will be will be more focused on how we're going to fund the development of this and looking at the project finance side and, and you need that document as a critical piece to that um, so that we can um, get this thing uh, shovel ready in 2025 and in operations by 2026. So let's move on and touch on your finances and your balance sheet. How much cash do you currently have on hand and how will you allocate that in the coming year? Yeah, so we've got about 40 million in cash uh, in the bank right now. Um, we also have about 20 million of uh, unspent uh, government grants that are still to come in. So we're at a working uh, capital of about $60 million. Um, <clears throat> the majority of that is going to be allocated to um, a couple of things. One, obviously moving into the feasibility study next year, doing all the engineering for that. That's pretty critical. We'll be staffing up a little bit to add a couple of project and process engineers to assist with that, that big task. And we're also contemplating uh, doing some demo next year um, and more details of that will come out to the market as we, as we uh, solidify those plans. Um, to uh, to look at what that full process looks like operating that in Alberta. Um, and then obviously some of the most important activity uh, that's going to happen is, is as I've talked about some of the corporate activities, we're increasing our uh, corporate team uh, here at E3, adding some sophistication to it to go out and uh, do a couple of things. One is um, look to find strategic partners to develop this project. Um, we've built a very strong reputation in the industry of uh, committing to things and getting them done. And I think that bodes well um, to find good partners that are willing to work with good companies to uh, find offtake um, and, and uh, other types of strategic arrangements. Um, and that all leads us to um, a project financing that we'll be completing, uh, you know, working on through this next year. And then usually those wrap up once the feasibility study is out um, and the final sort of um, I's and T's get crossed post that. So, um, you know, that takes us into 25 and and uh, and then we can be shovel ready. So, it, you know, next year is, is going to be very, very busy for us. Um, 2023 was the catalyst year. Um, the success of the pilot was fundamental. Um, we're very excited to see that. Uh, the the pre-feasibility, though, is, is the launching pad. We get that out. We get that going. Um, the project from there just moves forward um, and we get more and more certain that we're going to start uh, doing the all important thing that every company needs to do at some point, which is generate revenue. And I think that for us, getting this plant built and operating by 26 is uh, is a very strong goal. And Chris, when you talk about strategic partners, um, I want to get a better sense of who that might be. Would that be other lithium producers or OEMs or what? Yeah, I think we're we're open. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, one of the definitives that we need are customers. Um, and to get project financing, one of the critical aspects is to have uh, offtake contracts, but this is what the industry does. This is standard course. Uh, most of lithium today is sold under some uh, direct sales contract. And so that's the number one goal ultimately is, is to find those customers. Um, through that though, the industry has seen um, more of a strategic relationship with those. I, I think they bode really well because things like qualification, um, so if you have a more of a direct relationship with your customer, um, that's not just a sales contract, um, that bodes well for your qualification, for getting the product into the batteries, for getting through that process and, uh, and working more closely with them on a day-to-day -day basis and not just, uh, you know, signing the contract and then delivering the product in, in 2026. And, and I think that that is where the industry is going right now, um, because I think that the shortness of supply and that that supply differential that the market is predicting and it's it's just fundamental to the fact that it takes a lot longer to build a mine than it does a uh, battery plant um, and so being able to secure your supply to enable that your cars have lithium in them is fundamental to some of these companies and it's not just oems it's also the battery companies are, are looking at this very closely as well um, and so you know i think that e3 offers itself up as a good partner um, in a good stable jurisdiction, um, we'll be able to uh, supply securely the, the materials of need. And then looking at around the industry, you know, I think there's lots of opportunities to talk to some other companies that aren't necessarily customers as well 
um, you know, there's a, there's a, a plant that needs to get built. And I think E3 is looking at opportunities to find those people that can help us out and uh, and get this the, the certainty of this project. And the conversations are already well underway, but again, the, the launching pad for most of this is that pre-feasibility study. So let's just summarize all of this for our viewers in terms of the uh, path or the road to production. You mentioned you want to go into production by 2026. So what are the next steps in order to meet that objective? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the next little while, we've got a bunch of news coming out um, about the success of the pilot. We'll be talking about, you know, the downstream processing, the uh, eventually we'll outline um, the technology that we plan to use for the first commercial plant, both for the daily perspective, whether that's ours or third parties, as well as um, the uh, the downstream processing and all of that work to understand that. And, and it's a combination of those two pieces because they have to work together. Um, that, that work is ongoing right now as the results from the pilot uh, come in. We still have one more system that we're testing. So we're going to be waiting for that to come in um, before we uh, we make the final assessment. Um, but all of the work is happening right now. I think that's very exciting because that locks a lot of things in. That certainty of that really drives us forward because then the next step is to work with those companies to design a commercial plant. Uh, so take the data we've gathered from the pilot and design something commercially. Um, and then we're looking at, as I mentioned, at a demo in 2024 as we do the engineering. Um, and then uh, we want to have the fees done sort of late 24, early 25. Uh, it's about the right time frame, 12 months from, from pre-fees to fees. Um, and then, you know, it's project financing, it's it's detailed design, you're ordering equipment, things start showing up on site, um, you start constructing, you start drilling wells, and, you know, you aim to be hopefully in operations before the end of 2026. Um, so it's a, it's a lot of work, but um, it's how the company creates value. And if this one project, this one plant, the first plant is successful, you know, the real opportunity for E3 is four more of those. And and that opportunity, when you look around at what we have in terms of we've got land in Saskatchewan, we've got the Rocky property, we haven't looked at yet from any detail. I, I think there's a good um, uh, opportunity for some M&A uh, in the space as well. I think there's, you know, we have, we have a good cash balance um, that can't be said for all of the DLE companies out there right now that are bit further behind us trying to get their projects running and I think there's some good opportunities um, there's also a lot of interest in companies owning their own project bigger companies um, in the space and so I think there's there's lots and lots of opportunity for E3 to continue to create value find uh, creative and clever ways um, to finance ourselves and to build this company into becoming um, what the, the ultimate vision is over time is a global lithium producer um, and supplying directly to the battery industry so battery quality products whether it be Hydroxide as our first plant, carbonate or even lithium metal in the future um, is a big goal for E3. Chris, as we wrap up, what can investors expect in terms of news flow in the coming weeks and months from E3 lithium? Yeah, I think as I mentioned, um, still a lot of uh, stuff coming out that solidify the plans of what E3 is up to. And I think um, what the investors can see from E3 is that um, the maturation that 2023 has enabled us to do is going to be outlined in its finality as we go through the next four months. So you're going to start to see a bunch of really strong announcements about technology providers and process paths forward. You know, obviously the, the pre-feasibility study, um, very exciting stuff uh, all coming out. We're working on a bunch of corporate stuff that's harder to talk about um, that I think is equally exciting. Um, so I think there's just, there's lots and lots happening at E3. Um, and as I mentioned, we, we've got lots of capital at our disposal um, to deploy, to do uh, the right things. We're actually being very smart. We've always been good stewards of capital. We spend very little relative to our peers to get to the project to where we are today. And, and that will continue to, to move us forward as well as we um, look to develop this project and, uh, and minimize the dilution for our shareholders, maximizing the value. And that's fundamental on everyone's minds here at E3. Well, it sounds like you and your team are going to be very busy in the coming weeks and months. And I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today and providing a great overview of E3 Lithium. Yeah, thanks for having me on today, James.